this is really an honor to be here in a really uh, special uh, environment and audience to have uh, for talking about my work. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about human genetic diversity. And uh, this is something that we carry with us in this room, right? We each have DNA, and it each differs a little bit. And trying to understand that and understand the stories that it tells, it tells stories about our human history as a whole, has been a big part of my career and, and what I've been doing. And um, so I'm excited to share with you about some of the, the tasks that we have and, and challenges in trying to visualize and trying to make it possible to understand what's in these large data sets because uh, when we read it off, it's, it's an immense amount of information. So um, I want to start though with this quote uh, that I like and, and um, it's that the beginning of modern science can be dated from when general questions such as how was the universe created, what is matter made of, what is the essence of life, were replaced by such limited questions as how does a stone fall? How does water flow in a tube? How does blood circulate in vessels? And the substitution had an amazing result. While asking general questions led to limited answers, asking limited questions turned out to provide more and more general answers. It's sort of part of the scientific mindset, but part of why sometimes even when we, you know, we're asking very limited questions, they end up having these huge, interesting answers. So and that's maybe no more powerful than in the world of DNA, where looking at this tiny little molecule and looking at differences between pairs of molecules and asking questions like how does DNA vary across human individuals can give us insights into the whole peopling of the planet. Okay, so hopefully by the end of the lecture we'll actually understand maybe a little bit of how that, that happens. Um, and there are lots of other applications of you know, studying this, this little molecule DNA has had all sorts of interesting implications from uh, being able to understand where in a chromosome are different genetic variants that impact disease that help give us a clue of how diseases work, which help give us clues about therapies for, to intervene with the outcomes of disease. Uh, implications in forensics, both in the criminal justice system and in the kind of opposite, the Innocence Project and um, projects like uh, with the mothers of the desaparecidos in Argentina, um, helping find connections to lost children. Um, in mass disaster situations, like in uh, the um, victims of the World Trade Center bombings, uh, connecting them back to their families. Uh, and uh, this book, Skull Wars, covers questions about uh, Native American samples, uh, skeletons that are found and have been debated as to whether they uh, are Native American and should be returned to Native American peoples or uh, continue to be studied by archaeologists who, who uh, have made claims that they're not Native American. And I'll come back to that actually in one of my examples to um, applications in personal ancestry. You've probably seen commercials for 23andMe and Ancestry DNA. And full disclosure, I, I do some advising for Ancestry DNA. <laughs> but these, uh, these companies now, they're like, you know, you spit in a tube and you send it in and they'll tell you something about your, your ancestry. Um, uh, to clinical genetics. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, families who have a child that has some uh, disorder that is not able for their, their local clinicians to diagnose and they, they sequence the genomes of the parent and the child and there are more and more cases of finding a particular aberrant mutation in the child and then realizing, oh, there's a drug that actually interacts with that protein and we can go ahead and, and start a therapy that can um, uh, provide help. Uh, not all cases are so hopeful. In many cases, they find it's a, a mutation of the gene that there's no way to interact with it. But uh, um, it, it at least uh, provides some answers. Um, uh, then uh, questions of evolution and anthropology, which is a lot of what, what my work is in, in terms of understanding human history. And mechanisms of heredity. Looking at genetic diversity, we can learn things about how recombination and mutation take place, these very basic processes that are part of uh, heredity. So um, today I'm going to give a little background on how we measure genetic diversity and then uh, talk about this main topic, visualizing human genetic diversity. And this will be kind of one long story. This will just kind of flow one into the other. We'll talk about genes and geography, then maps of individual allele frequencies, and then trying to get a genome-wide summary of all these variation patterns, and then put it all together. And at the end, realizing that I can't possibly cover the subject, that's some recommended reading, some good <laughs> books that are like approachable that you can you know, go deeper on, okay? So, um, so background, how do we measure and analyze genetic variation? So um, just to give a little review of what we're talking about here, in each of our cells inside the nucleus, we carry copies of DNA. And there are 22, these are, these are long uh, molecules that uh, we have two copies of each of these molecules. So, and we have 22 sets of them uh, with a pair of, uh, of ones that determine our sex, the sex chromosomes. And one of these is from our mother and one from the father. Okay, so if we look at chromosome five here and we take 
uh, one of them, then maybe the one that came from the mother here and the one that came from the father. And we align the DNA for the same identical stretch of DNA. Um, that's, uh, it, it may not actually be perfectly identical. So here we see these base pairs of a single DNA molecule. They're the same here. We have an AT base pair, an AT base pair, and then moving along here we see a difference. Where there's a CG base pair in one, one copy of the DNA and a TA base pair in the other copy. So the, the mother gave this person a CG, the father gave them a TA. Okay? And this is genetic diversity in its smallest level, just in a sample size of two, two pieces of DNA, a difference. Um, and uh, so when we look at these, we can refer to them as uh, a, a variant locus with a C and T allele. Okay, so we just look at the C and the T, or we can, if we look at the red strand, or we can look at the green strand and call it a G and A allele. Okay, and or abstractly, we can just call them the A and B alleles at some locus, or big A and little a is maybe what you saw in your in your biology classes. And actually, this is kind of neat that this you know generic language big A little a is kind of like an algebraic notation for these molecular variants. And a lot of the theory of genetics was developed before we even understood that DNA is the molecule that um, drives it all, right? Mendel was doing crosses with peas and postulating the existence of these alleles before we even knew that DNA was the stuff of heredity. It's kind of amazing. Yeah? What does allele mean? Allele, it just means um, a, a, a difference. So it's, uh, yeah. And you know what's hilarious? The first paper I ever published my mother, she, uh, she calls it, John, I'm, I'm very proud of you. But the, in the title had the word allele. She says, but what is an allele? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I heard you say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a jargon word. It basically means uh, uh, one of various types. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and please interrupt me. There's a lot of jargon in genetics. It's actually one of the, the um, things that's an unfortunate barrier to getting into it. But the things actually aren't that complicated once you know so this other word that's going to come up a lot is SNP. It's a single nucleotide polymorphism. So we're looking at a single nucleotide, a single, uh, uh, the nucleotides are these uh, base pairs here. And then polymorphisms means, means uh, many morphs. So that there are, see how there's more than one type here? So it's a polymorphism. Okay, so, um, Okay, so these, these variants exist. Uh, it's interesting that they exist. We might ask, like, why doesn't the mother and father always have an identical piece of DNA that they're passing on to their children? Why would there be variation? Um, what forces are going to promote variation? Which ones are going to make it uh, go away? Okay. And, um, but, uh, and that's, a, you know, big questions of population genetics. Um, but how do we measure them? So there's two major approaches for measuring them. And so let's just focus on the top part of the slide. The, these, uh, this approach is, is using uh, what's called a genotyping array. So these things are about the size of, I don't know, like the length of my finger. And in the middle, they have this little black square, which is like a, a, a little silicon wafer that on it has little pieces of DNA that uh, will match pieces of DNA from an individual sample. And so like I would take my DNA cut it up into pieces, wash it across this wafer, and where it matches, it would bind and give a light signal when it, it, there's a chemical reaction to throw a light signal. And so we can build the pieces of DNA on the array to probe for places in the genome that we know vary. So like back here, we can build a little uh, piece of DNA that probes the T allele, a piece of DNA that probes the C allele. And then we can measure how much uh, of the light intensity goes off on the T allele probes versus the A allele probes, and in that way learn what that individual has at that location in their genome. So here's an, an example where we can measure off the allele A signal intensities, how strong the binding is by with these, the, uh, this chemical reaction, and uh, here the strength of the allele B signal intensity. So if somebody is an, is has a, A from, you know, from the A from their mother, A from their father, they're going to light up this channel really strongly. If they've got B, B, they're going to light up this one. And if they're what we call a heterozygote, they've got A from their mother, B from their father, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. So this little, this little experiment of measuring the intensities at, uh, for these probes for a single location in the genome is happening at a really dense scale across this whole wafer. It's 
it's actually possible to measure on the scale of 500,000 to a million locations in the genome using very uh, high definition cameras shining down on this little silicon wafer. Okay, so it's an amazing technology. Um, and uh, the key, yeah, and the key part is that it's probing places that we know that already vary. Okay. And uh, then the other approach, and, and I will say that the technology actually won't matter much going forward. It's just kind of, uh -huh. I think, nice to know how we measure these things, right? It's not so mysterious, um, although it's hard for me to give it true justice. Okay, so this bottom half of this slide is the, this very new approach, and it's sometimes called next generation sequencing, although now there's like the next next generation, so now we're having to call it second generation sequencing because there's the third coming. Um, but the, um, the idea here is that there's this, uh, um, uh, this is a, um, a device that has lanes in it, and within each lane, uh, there is a similar kind of surface, like I just described, and the DNA is chopped up. Well, let's kind of pretend that this is the surface. The DNA is chopped up, and then it's, uh, you know, some chemical tricks are done so that every piece of DNA ends up landing, like, and standing vertically on this surface. So we have lots of little pieces of DNA from a single individual sticking up, okay? And then um, the, uh, there's another kind of fluorescence reaction where depending on what base is carried at each different sequence, little piece of DNA, uh, a light reaction goes off and a picture is taken. And so, and this is done in cycles. So in the first cycle, we might take a picture and see a here, G here, uh, A here, you know, and so on and so forth. And that tells us what the first base is. Then we repeat this whole round of chemistry and take another picture and we read off the second base on all these molecules. And then the, take another picture and get the third base. And the stack of them, we can read off the sequence of DNA in many small pieces. So is of that DNA. what happens when you spit into that cup and you send your ancestry in to see if you know that's how some friends know they're related to George Washington yeah so that those <laughs> the, yeah so when you spit in a tube they're using this approach uh, these arrays so these are much uh, the top one yeah and these are much more affordable so do, you actually, and do these places actually have a sample of like George Washington's DNA oh uh, they uh, <laughs> probably not no <laughs> oh my yeah. God, I'm yeah. yeah yeah no. <laughs> yeah yeah Great, great, great. Yeah. Great, great, great. Yeah. Um, no, so maybe by the end I can really come back to that. Um, yeah. But, uh, and it'd be easier, there'll be more concepts on the table okay, to answer right. that question when, with. When but you yeah. talk about the ones on the table, are you talking yeah. about like the 46 chromosomes that you have, those, that sequence? Yeah, so those, yeah, you'll take all, like the whole genome and chop it up into pieces, and then these short pieces will be sequenced. Right, uh, like every one of these dots will represent one little short piece of DNA. Okay. And then the big challenge is actually putting it all back together. Because we have three billion base pairs, and these approaches read them off in lengths of like 100 base pairs at a time. So you have a huge like problem of stitching together the, the 100 base pairs mm -hmm. to make the three billion. Okay. Um, and that's, so there's a lot of mm -hmm. algorithms so that go into that. Yeah. So, so they're sticking up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I told you guys I really wanted to take this one. They're sticking up. Cycle one is the thing that's touching the, the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is cycle two the next one up? That's right. How yeah. are they getting that without it touching? Uh, so there's a, um, <laughs> a set of nucleotides that are washed across wow. the, the surface. And they're actually binding to their complement and giving off a reaction. And it's, it's actually what happens is the piece of DNA, you know this double-stranded part of DNA that's two strands? So what's happening is you peel one off and then you start building it back one piece at a time. And then taking a picture. <laughs> I should have said that earlier. Okay. And so and then you take a picture at each step. And depending on which base goes in, it shines a different color of light. The base refer to the base pair? Is that what base? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this, yeah, this base is a single base that's going to match to its pair. Yeah. Yeah, the chop of the DNA, uh, there are, there are, um, 
for most of these, they use like s there's something called sonication, like shooting, or, like ultrasound. It's like uh, yeah, it's just like physically breaking, you know, kind of shaking it a lot, essentially. What's that? Yeah, the sonication approach. I'm not a I'm I'm not a bench scientist even. I don't even my lab all my people we sit at computers, but <laughs> sonication, <laughs> as I understand it, is using like really high frequency sound waves in the sample to just kind of shake it up and break the pieces down. Yeah, yeah. At a, at a what? A gong? No, just sound. Sound bath. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. You, that, probably you don't want to yeah, have that level like of sound. It's probably a bad. Yeah. 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 If you get, if you get to the, that same level, it's probably not very yeah. therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, so we have a sense. Sure. It's chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Get it out. All right. Okay. <laughs> oh god. So this is because this is where I start. Okay. So yeah. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. So we get to a table <laughs> where we have, uh, you know, all that gets processed. And at the end of the day, you get a big table where each row is an individual. And each uh, column, you might have a bunch of individual identifier information. And then for each location in the genome, each, each SNP, uh, each variable position in the genome, a readout of what um, uh, two alleles they have. Okay? So here, maybe this individual CC, CC, there's a TC. There's a bunch of CCCs, there's a TC, so on and so forth. Okay? And so this is a view of our genetic diversity. Yeah. Okay, so back to like what do these letters mean? Yeah. Just like A means like they have brown hair. Like yeah, so, uh, well, for s there are um, literally millions of these places in the genome that vary. Some of them, and actually most of them, have no impact on our, our phenotypes, our, our traits. And, um, and so actually most of them just reflect how people are moving. It's, it's a, like a mutation arises, it's carried around the world by by people and then, you know, and that's, it's, it's fake. Um, and there's some that determine things like hair color, like skin color, a topic I'll come back to at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but, but the, the, any one of these, we might, we don't know when we start the projects, any of these projects, but, but as a community, we're starting to learn, okay, this location of the genome matters for this, this one for that, um, but yeah. So it's not dissimilar to like computer coding, like like sequences of numbers that are kind of chosen from like the study of like all the letters and numbers are picked sort of not arbitrarily, but it's not dissimilar to like computer code. Yeah. Um, oh, in the way that like the the way that DNA ends up. Well, the way just the way that the data is like written out, like looking at this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it looks uh, well. Computer code is usually even easier to understand than this, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, there are a lot of similarities and, and, and a lot of similarities with different types of data, actually. So um, uh, we'll end up using tools that are used uh, in meteorology. In, uh, um, there's some things that connect to like how Google looks at the internet. Um, uh, so there's a lot of neat overlaps and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, when people talk about big data, this is a type of big data. And some of the principles you learn from studying uh, big data of like click trails on the internet, you know, can apply in genomics and vice versa. So you have a lot of, actually some of our students end up getting hired by Google and so on, yeah. It's like big data, but you don't necessarily, like there's no like assigned value necessarily to the pieces. Yet. Yeah. Like you, that's what you're figuring out. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so that's good. So the big question is, it's, this is really a, a lot of my work is in data visualization. Sure. It's like getting from this to something that actually conveys meaning and information. <laughs> yeah. So because the, 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 the issue is that these uh, tables, I'm showing just like the upper left-hand corner. Oftentimes for the data sets we're working with, they'll have 2,500 rows. And uh, like one of the data sets I'm going to talk about, yeah, it's 2,500 rows and 80 million columns. Right? So you, know, you don't you, you don't Excel. you don't open oh that God. in Excel. Yeah. Right? That's a bad idea, right? Yeah. So 
Okay, so this, this research field of population genetics, like classically what its question is, is like why does genetic variation exist and how does it evolve? So why isn't every one of these columns just all the same? You know, like you might naively think, oh, there's a right way to be genetically, and so why isn't everything just identical? Uh, um, uh, or why isn't it like hyper diverse, right? And so, you know, why does it some areas, and so like, um, uh, Drosophila fruit flies, on average, have a difference every one in every hundred base pairs. Humans have a difference only one in every thousand. What, what are the factors controlling that? Okay. So, um, and then this is a point that I was making earlier, that, that a major result is something you just want to kind of get in the milieu as we begin, is that most of these genetic variants have little or no effect on the individuals that carry them. So they spread through a population simply by chance. Okay. Genetic, and we call this chance change in the frequencies of these, uh, these different uh, alleles or variants, genetic drift. Okay. okay, so what I do is look at human genetic variation across different scales. So across global scales, I've worked a lot in European populations. I've worked a lot specifically in Sardinian populations and specifically on this particular um, region called Oliastra in a specific valley there called the Lanuse Valley. Um, and, uh, um, and developing methods for analyzing this type of data. So um, now we're gonna get into the heart of it, which is like visualizing human genetic diversity. So um, we've got this challenge, right, of trying to make some progress getting beyond just having this table. Um, and uh, I like this quote by uh, Eisen, Spellman, Brown, and Bodstein, our paper I read when I was a graduate student, which was uh, very nice in a very scientific world to read a quote like this, which is we need to develop everybody to see the information in the massive tables of quantitative measurements that these approaches produce. One of the rare papers really emphasizing the importance of visualization in science. And um, Mike Eisen uh, is actually interesting in our political climate right now, uh, very prolific and and vociferous scientists has just decided to run for Senate in California. Yeah. So um, just uh, so upset about the st status of science and the current political discussions to get um, better voices represented at the highest levels of government. So, um, okay, so there are different ways to visualize uh, genetic variation and specifically something called population structure. So this is the idea that that set of individuals that we have in our study some of them may be more closely related to each other than others, okay? And that's a very important first step in any analysis because um, in, for instance, disease genetic studies, if you're trying to make a uh, comparison of cases for a disease versus controls, a standard kind of epidemiological study design, you need to match your cases and controls. So if there are subtle differences in the genetics, it can be confusing to, when you're trying to map the disease. Um, or if you're in, uh, you know, working at the field museum and you're trying to study some interesting uh, species that nobody's ever looked at before, you want to understand, or is it actually, you know, visually it might look like one group, but there actually might be four subgroups, and the genetics can help you understand those. So, um, so some of the approaches that are used for trying to see how individuals are related to each other are the following. And one of them is called admixture proportion inference. And this is if you've, if you've seen like 23andMe, Ancestry, this, this, is, this is the approach that's sort of like you're 36% this and 26% that, okay? So each of these bars represents a single individual and how much of the bar is one color here is how, what proportion of their genome is estimated to be of a certain source population, okay? And so when you run this across all humans, you get samples from Africa that show 100% of this source population from Africa, samples from Europe in green, a lot of them being 100% that European source population, samples from the Mideast being more of a mixture of a, a, a source population from there, one from Europe, one from the Mideast, okay. Um, a, a challenge with these is sort of assuming that there are discrete source populations that everything's like mixed of, right? But actually human genetic variation might be a little more messy than that that there aren't these like clean source populations that everybody's a mixture of. And so there are other approaches that just try to like represent the individuals on a two-dimensional plane without assuming that they're mixtures of, of discrete groups. These ordination methods, and these are a set of methods that I've worked with a lot, and I'll show you some, some uh, examples of that. There are also tree-based methods of trying to reconstruct the, the history of the populations in a tree-like you know, pattern, so uh, where you can see maybe how population splits occurred as, um, as evolution took place. And then how contacts took place over long distances. So these are some of these edges in the tree that uh, 
represent. Uh, so for instance, an interesting one here is like, I don't know if you can see very small, but like this purple is a lot of Native American groups. There's the Maya, and there's an edge coming from European populations over to the Maya because of the European contact. And so like Mayans living today have some European ancestry in them, and that shows up when you use this kind of representation. Okay, so, um, so before I talk more about these, these ordination methods, I want to put it all in perspective. So it's helpful to kind of zoom out and look at our diversity in the context of primate diversity. So this is another paper that came out when I was a, a PhD student. And, um, and it's just a fantastic, like one of my favorite graphs in evolutionary genetics. <laughs> so cool. Uh, so uh, what it is is a particular region of chromosome X that was sequenced. And then based on the sequence, a tree was constructed. And it, the sequences were obtained from 72 humans, several bonobos, several chimpanzees, about four gorillas, about six orangutans. And uh, what you see here is notice that like the four gorillas, like if we looked at gorillas, we had with our eye, naked eyes, we go, oh, they're all the same, right? They're all like, roughly the same, right? And uh, yeah, we look at humans and we think we're all so different from each other. But at the genetic level, we look at 72 humans are just this tight cluster. We're all really closely related to one another. So like two gorillas on average are more distantly related in sequence than, mm. than we are, okay? Mm. So like understanding that conundrum is like hopefully by the end we'll have, we'll, we'll understand that. Um, although with the pace I'm going, we're gonna be having dessert. <laughs> you guys are eating and I'm just gonna be going through the slide. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so this point that we're all very closely related that we have one difference every thousand base pairs, one of the lowest levels of diversity. You know, it's kind of on the spectrum of levels of diversity across species. We're towards the lower end, huh. um, not the lowest, but we're on the lower end. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's interesting. Okay, so we're all closely related, wasn't, and yeah. Wasn't there a study that came out recently that talked about how that we that there was a collapse in the the, G, the DNA population because there was some disease and. So therefore, they concluded that we came from a very small base of DNA, and that accounts for the tightness. Yeah, that's, um, uh, we'll come back to that at the okay. end. Right. Yeah, okay, so uh, the, the usual explanation for that is that we were a small population in Africa that then spread across the globe very yeah. quickly, so we haven't had time to accrue a lot of diversity, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so, the, okay, so we could take that big table, okay? And now we're gonna go into these ordination methods. Take that big table, convert the genotypes into numbers, zero, one, and two, okay? So now I have each individual as a row, each SNP is polymorphisms, but instead of two letters, I've got a single number, okay? And, um, and uh, this is a, a matrix that we can analyze.